Working on CRTs can be dangerous and if not lethal. You should not attempt to open up or fix any CRT without having good understanding of safety precautions. I am not responsible for any harm or damage done to anyone or anything. After all, this video is just a visual diary of my progress. And finally, if you have epilepsy or photosensitivity, I do not recommend you watch this video. It had only been a few months after I serviced my BVM20F1 that I was itching to fix another CRT, given how much I learnt in the process. So I picked up a colour monitor nearby that was advertised as non-working, and I later discovered it was an obscure monitor with next to no available documentation, and I was about to enter another CRT rabbit hole. So here's introducing the Atari 900 RGB monitor. Getting the monitor working was actually pretty easy after I trouble shut the fuse and power switch. AC was coming in, but there wasn't any power beyond this IC. I reflowed the chip, and that was all it needed to get the monitor to power on. And while I was at it, I also reflowed the flyback transformer for good measure. There's a similar monitor that I saw in a YouTube repair video called the Commodore 1084 ST, and it's the closest thing internally to what I have. The components on the chassis appear to be rearranged, and they use the same neckboard layout. Build quality seems slightly better for the Commodore, with the use of connectors instead of directly soldered wires held in place by hot glue. The 1084 ST doesn't appear to have separate input boards, whereas my Atari monitor has two separate boards, one for RGB and one for composite and S-video. The tube is also a Hitachi, made in Singapore. Having a look at the exterior, there's sliding potentiometers for brightness and contrast, and underneath another for chroma when in composite and S-video. And to the right there's the volume slider for stereo sound. There's also this ball and socket swivel base that lets the monitor spin 360 degrees. The monitor can also tarte, but it would look better without the stand attached, but no big deal. The Atari logo is also on the wrong side, as it usually precedes the Atari name. The only other identifiers on the monitor are on the back sticker which reads Atari 900. Here we have some more pots to change the vertical size and horizontal position. I really like that all the pots are accessible on the fly without needing an OSD, which makes it more versatile when you have multiple consoles or FPGA cores. Over to the right are the stereo inputs, as well as composite and S-video through the RCA jacks. On my first test, I couldn't get an image because of a broken internal pin. I didn't have an exact right angle replacement, and the only thing I had large enough to mount the hole in the ground plane board was a female BNC connector. I confirmed that the monitor can display a 50Hz PAL color image and otherwise black and white NTSC 60Hz. Composite video actually looks pretty good. I thought I'd scored the jackpot with these big juicy scan lines, but it turns out that the vertical size pot was dialed way too high. The only other mention of this monitor was in the Atari ST Facebook group. So I contacted the only other owner of this monitor that I could find, and they said they had it hooked up to either an Atari STFM or a Mega. And in their photo, they were using the DB15 port, so it must have been hooked up in RGB, but I'm not sure if this was an aftermarket or custom cable. So to work out the DB15 pinout, I connected a Mega Drive 2 to the passive SCAR to RCA breakup box I made. I first found the ground pin with a multimeter to the shield of the composite input. I then used a test wire on the SCART red pin. You want to display either an all white screen or any video that you know will display all three RGB signals at once. 
Then I simply poke the test wire into each hole starting from the top left. Found analog red, then green and blue. And next was sync, which will synchronize the video horizontally and vertically, so there shouldn't be any rolling pattern. If you're not already familiar, there's different types of sync in analog video. Starting with composite video is sync. This is literally the video that's typically carried along the yellow RCA cable, which also contains a sync signal. Then there's Lumera Sync, which is used in S-Video, a component video, to carry the brightness information along with sync. Some monitors and devices don't accept these types of video as sync, because they need the video stripped out of them to have the sync signal cleaned, which is what's known as C-Sync, which stands for Composite Sync. This is different to composite video sync, as the term composite sync refers to the composition of horizontal and vertical sync. C sync can be delivered at 75 ohm level as well as higher voltage TTL. And then there's HV sync, which splits the horizontal and vertical sync into their own signals, which you'd commonly see in the VGA standard. <laughs> The SCART cable I was using sends composite video as sync from the Mega Drive. So when I was displaying a red signal, I was probing each pin with sync to see if I could stop the rolling, but nothing happened. So it doesn't like dirty sync, but what about HV or C sync? I grabbed my GBS that I modified with Rama's custom firmware to convert RGBS into RGB HV whilst preserving the 15 kHz horizontal sync rate. Starting with horizontal sync, I probed the bottom row and the video would sync horizontally on pin 12. Now I just needed it to sync vertically. By trial and error, I tapped V-Sync on H-Sync and I got a stable picture. So this confirmed that the monitor needs C-Sync, but will it accept 75 ohm C-Sync or TTL? I grabbed my SCART scanline generator which I essentially use as a sync stripper for 75 ohm C-Sync output. And when I tested with clean sync, it still rolled horizontally, which tells me it needs TTL level C-Sync. So off to the strippers I went and made my own LM1881 sync stripping circuit and left the output voltage as TTL level by emitting any inline resistor on the output. I was a little hopeful that it would accept 480p, but it's really no surprise that this monitor is 15kHz only. The monitor now displays a beautiful RGB picture, with deep blacks partly due to the dark tint on the tube. And the richness of the colours leads me to think that it has low operating hours. For a 14 inch monitor, it also gives pretty decent scan lines. Definitely more pronounced than this consumer 14 inch sharp CRT that I RGB modded. Disregard the colour differences because I took these shots at a different time on different consoles because I didn't know that I was going to use them in a comparison. From experience, I'd rate this Hitachi tube somewhere around 5 to 600 TV lines. Subjectively putting it on par with a low to mid grade professional monitor. It's only when there's an RGB signal that you can display in green monochrome. I grew up playing an Amstrad CPC on a pure green monochrome CRT. And even though the mister can output analog green on the Amstrad core, it's still fun to play games just as I remembered them. It also gives Game Boy games a healthy green glow, which I prefer over the standard colour palette from the Super Game Boy. I wanted to test out S-Video even though I'm probably never going to use it seeing it only displays colour in PAL 50Hz. So I made a simple S-Video to separate RCA cable. 
and while I was at it, I also doubled the input with an RCA connector to allow for composite video without having to disconnect the adapter, seeing they share the same RCA jack. As long as only one device is plugged in at the same time, this is totally fine. This is a one-chip Super Nintendo running Yoshi's Island in 50Hz. Composite looks good, but S-Video is noticeably sharper, and it also gets rid of the mild dot crawl. It's still no match for being able to run video in full 60Hz RGB. For curiosity's sake, I tapped into the PB and PR signals to test out component, but inputting Luma through the regular input caused a Luma offset, so I would have had to input Luma somewhere after the line delay chip. Even though I mapped out the 15 pin connector for analog RGBS, I still wanted to map out the remaining pins to fully discover their function and to see if this monitor had any other secrets. There were still 10 pins remaining, and looking at the bare PCB, four of these weren't connected to anything, which left only six pins to find out their function. Now remember that this monitor can also display RGBI. I don't have any consoles that can output a digital RGB signal, so I'll grab the GBS again and output a 15 kHz RGB HV signal. Because the peak-to-peak -peak voltage of standard analog video is 700 millivolts, it's not enough to turn on the digital RGB pins. I used one of the HV signals instead to output a higher voltage in order to find the digital RGB pins. I can confirm that these are the digital red, green, and blue pins, and pin 1 is the RGBI intensity pin to give 16-bit CGA graphics. Pin 14 is a mystery though, applying any type of sync causes the screen to sync vertically. But all combinations of sync that I tried couldn't produce a stable picture. And believe me, I tried just about everything. It seems to trace to one of these transistors, and my best guess is that it's digital RGB sync. But a happy accident happens when I put vertical sync into pin 8, where the screen held vertically. I inserted horizontal sync into what I initially figured was the C-Sync pin, and it turns out that this is a dual-purpose pin, so this monitor can in fact accept analog RGBS, RGBHB, and digital RGBI. I was scratching my head why I didn't discover this earlier when I was testing with the GBS, so I pulled out the same setup that I initially used to test, and found out that the GBS doesn't output a signal that the monitor can sync to if the input is 50 hertz, so I tested the HV sync on my mister to see if maybe the monitor just didn't like HV 50 hertz. And at my surprise, the mister couldn't output any vertical sync worthy enough for the Atari 900. So I tested vertical sync voltage with this simple oscilloscope thanks to Bob from RetroRGB. The peak to peak voltage on V sync on the mister was 2.6 volt, and on the GBS was 2.9 and 60 hertz which worked just fine, but dropped to 2.7 volt when the input was 50 hertz. I also ran the mister in RGB HV through the GBS, and even that wouldn't sync at 60 hertz. The only thing that made the mister sync was an Extron RGB 580XI, and this boosted the vertical sync to 4.5 volts. So I gathered that the mister puts out too low of a vertical sync voltage for the Atari monitor and for the GBS to interpret and the GBS will only output an understandable vertical sync on this monitor when the input is 60Hz. But for the purpose of the Atari 900, it needs to receive vertical sync that's around 3 volt. With the DB15 connector all mapped out, my breakout cable has finally reached its final form. I have a standard VGA DB15 connector for RGB HV and RGBS, which is really convenient for hooking up the mister. RGBS and stereo sound can also be passed through the female SCART port with a toggle for the sync stripper. And there's external power input to power the sync circuit for backup. The Atari 900 ended up being an amazing RGB monitor for retro gaming. In all its obscurity, I'd love to know if there's any other owners of this monitor and what cables it came with to hook up retro computers. For the few other owners of an Atari 900, 
I hope the pinout was useful to adapt your own custom cables for glorious RGB. And if you happen to know more information, please share it with this German website, Atari Museum. That's all for now on this monitor. Please like, share, subscribe, and I hope to get some more videos out on other CRT and retro mods. Thanks all for watching, and happy gaming.